Hello, everybody. My friends, I look upon you all, even though I can't see you, as my good friends, and I'm glad to be with you again today. What is this weekend, you know? Well, it's the summer solstice. Uh, June 20th is tomorrow, and uh, June 20th becomes the longest day of the year. Hmm. <laughs> Are we ready for that yet? And then it's all downhill after that, but imperceptibly so. We won't notice it. We no longer have to repair to the ancient rocks of Stonehenge, where Marsh and I did go and see this, uh, to see when, when the sun has reached its highest point. We can see something about it on the internet if we really want to. We, there may be more on there than we care to know about the summer solstice. Now, serendipity. <clears throat> Think about that word. It means things happening by complete chance without any planning. Uh, it's been that kind of a week for me. <clears throat> um, I found some poems while I was unpacking a box. And these poems dated from 1956 to 1958. And <laughs> here's a sample of the yellowed paper that they were uh, typed on by that old mechanical typewriter that I suspect a lot of you, not just me, but a lot of you had in college <clears throat> where we typed those term papers and <laughs> we used a lot of correction tape. Remember that? Uh, young people nowadays don't have to deal with correction tape and they don't have to deal with mechanical typewriters and they don't have to change the tape in the typewriter. Oh my, <laughs> so many wonderful things that have gone by the wayside. Uh, and then during the frenetic years of medical school and having kids, I forgot about them. And so serendipity ruled the other day and I unearthed those. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, well, maybe I can salvage these, make a few improvements, and um, they'll be at least decent enough to read on this program. I hope that turns out to be the case. Uh, now, I want you to look at this one. It's called The Plains of Iowa. And I want you to consider it as being a stack of postcards. And we're shuffling through the stack of postcards as we read the various stanzas of the poem. And, um, and so the uh, poem is not a story, you know, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. <clears throat> it's sort of a stack of postcards. So here is the plains of Iowa. There is no figuring trees, meadows, people, whose growing astounds in outrageous configurations. That pine, the one there in the dead gully, rearing from nothing in ungentle gash, grows, obscurely bent, vaguely green, the Amish are here, somehow set their roots to fruit the soil for a few acres to order soul. Shuffle fresh postcard faces where the bright car halts and skirts flashing kilted. These find in antique pastures crocuses, bluebills, and jack in the pulpit, calendar saints, of the approach of summer, of the fervent corn. It grows, they say, even though, even through still nights, the stars are quiet in heavy air, and in the woods morels grow. Bright paled in the morning twixt house and barn, the farmer walks. The field knows only Amish tillage, where no motors thrive. On rainy days, cyclists wait dry beneath the gable end of a covered bridge. Warm August remembers. Dust rises from dry roads. 
we drive to cool Victorian porches in slow breathing villages under elms. In vague passion, old men dream of a lost century. Pipe smoke excites a pageant in the plastic air. Overhead, the sky is fettered where the jet planes fly. Okay, well, maybe that's not too bad, but that's what I was doing in my younger days and <laughs> instead of studying the text for gross anatomy. Mm. <clears throat> Let's do one more from my long gone Iowa days. And this is a story this time. Uh, it's called uh, The Harvest. It was told me by my grandfather, but of course <laughs> not in verse. And uh, the iambic pentameter and the rhymes are what poets do to focus and embellish uh, an otherwise good story. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is The Harvest. We sweat too much to get that crop, considering price. Even the horses groaned in gritty heat, stirring the corn, scattering pheasants and mice, and Billy Norton died clutching the wagon on his feet. It was no violent enemy skulking near that seized his heart and filched away his breath. I stood there sweating down my country fear. It was none of us harvesters caused his harvest death. I wet a blue bandana from a cold canteen and plied old Billy with a cooling care, but had no hope to save a look so lean, standing a noontime wake with curious stare. Not more pale than ours his reamy face, its wrinkles drilled with mud of grease and dust, he slept some red since dying can't erase the lifelong fields. The wind and bodies rust. Some thought the sun had baked and dried him out and steamed away the fluids dear to living. And something like had happened him, no doubt. This was not the season of the sun's giving. I followed him to the iron-fenced county grass, employed my spade right-handedly besides to fit him firmly there, his end and compass, where he, to my certain knowledge, still resides. So that's the story of how Billy Norton died. And remember, in those old days of harvesting, mostly by handwork and with horses, you couldn't call the ambulance to come. You didn't have a cell phone. And um, you were way too far out in the country for them to get to until Billy expired. Nobody even had any idea of taking a dead body to the hospital in those days. You took them to the funeral home. And after appropriate celebration of their life and the tears wiped dry of their close relatives. They were buried with love and, and uh, true care in graves in the county courthouse or graves out in the country and land owned by the county or by a local church. So that's what happened back in, in those days. <clears throat> I remember it well. The last poem is going to be another summer poem. Let me reach over here and get it. <clears throat> this is in a book with also yellowed <laughs> sulfury pages. I think this book of uh, the pocket book of Robert Frost's poems. Uh, 
with illustrations and introduction by Lewis Undermeyer. <clears throat> I think this book cost, oh yes, here it is in the upper left-hand corner. This book costs 35 cents <laughs> back in the day. That was when a dollar was worth about what $7.50 would be worth today. <clears throat> it's amazing what politicians can do with the value of your money, isn't it? And they're still doing it. <clears throat> but don't let me go there. I'm going to read this poem. This is not one of Robert Frost's best-known poems. <clears throat> In fact, I try to avoid the uh, poems that have been come, become almost clichés that, that everybody interested in poetry already knows. <clears throat> this one is called Mowing. And it is a sonnet. It is a sonnet. But with a much different rhyme scheme than a Shakespearean sonnet. So see if you can figure this out. There was never a sound beside the wood but one, and that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. What was it? It whispered. I know not well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun, something perhaps about the lack of sound, and that was why it whispered and did not speak. It was no dream of the gift of idle hours or easy gold at the hand of fay or elf. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, not without feeble pointed spikes of flowers, pale orchises, and scared a bright green snake. The fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. My long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. <clears throat> now, this is a poem that rhymes, believe it or not. <clears throat> um, but, but it has a complex rhyme scheme. Um, the first and fourth lines rhyme. Let me read them. There was never a sound beside the wood but one. And that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. What was it whispered I knew not well myself? Here's the fourth line. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun. Sun rhymes with one, doesn't it? And that kind of complex rhyme screen, scheme goes throughout this thing. <clears throat> the next line is something perhaps about the lack of sound rhymes with the second line, and that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. And so it goes throughout the poem. Um, it's a completely different rhyme scheme than a Shakespearean sonnet that ends with a couplet. There are no couplets in this poem. <clears throat> but you can almost hear the quietude of the surroundings, way different than what it would be like in the country today, um, cutting, uh, cutting the meadow grass to make hay. And <clears throat> what he's saying here is that he's out there working, and the fact of him doing that is the sweetest dream that labor knows. My long sigh whispered and left the hay to make. And that means, of course, <clears throat> that the hay had to dry out before they could bale it. And that would be a completely separate, <clears throat> primarily handmade job. So that's Mowing by Robert Frost. And that poem was 
probably written in the, I don't know exactly when, but probably in the 1930s or early 1940s. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was a great poem. I took a chance reading a really professional poem after <laughs> reading my own, but that's the nature of this program. Almost anything goes as long as we can label it as poetry, and as long as I like it, because <laughs> I'm the editor of this program. <clears throat> um, the sonnets are deceptively simple to read, but some of them will fool you sometimes, and I would encourage all of you, if you can find, and you probably can find it online with little trouble at all, the poem Mowing by Robert Frost. And um, <clears throat> and just enjoy it, because it's a great poem written by a great poet. We'll see you, I hope, next week. In the meantime, don't spend too much time on politics. It's all mad right now. See you then. Bye now.